Jiaosu is a county seat in the southwestern part of Ili Kazakh Autonomous Prefecture in Xinjiang. Five kilometers to the east, the steppes stretch far into the distance. The locals call them the Xiaohongnahai Prairie. Standing silently in the grasslands are a dozen two-meter-tall granite statues. Some still have clearly defined facial features. Some are wearing hats and have ponytails. And some have both hands in front with a glass of liquor in the right hand. People call them the stone people of the Xiaohongnahai Prairie. There are also several hundred statues carved out of stone in other locations in Xinjiang outside of the prairie. They're all facing east, like signposts pointing towards some mysterious treasure. These stone statues have stood through thousands of years, and their dignified appearance still makes a strong impression on people today. Where are they from and whom do they represent? When were they created? Preliminary research conducted by Chinese archaeologist Huang Wenbi indicated that one of the statues has Turkic features. The Turkic people on horseback once dominated the Ili grasslands. Their tribes replaced the Xiongnu as the new overlords. By the time of Han Emperor Wu around the first century BC, the Han Empire had become one of the world's most powerful empires. The threat of the Xiongnu was gradually receding, and many of them were migrating inland. By the time of the 3rd century CE, the ethnic groups to the north had mostly become integrated with the greater Chinese family. Emperor Xiao Wen of the Northern Wei in particular promoted this process. Meanwhile, a Turkic people appeared in the Altai Mountains and began expanding north of today's Xinjiang. In 439, the Northern Wei Dynasty destroyed the Northern Liang Dynasty and the Gok Turks in the northern Liang defected to the Roran tribe, for whom they forged iron weaponry. Nearly a century later, in 552, under the leadership of Bumin Kagan, the Gok Turks revolted against the Roran and established a Turkic Khanate. Bumin Kagan referred to himself as Ili Kagan. After defeating the Roran, the Gok Turks expanded their sphere of influence, reaching the Greater Kingan Range to the east, the Aral Sea to the west, Lake Baikal in the north, and the Amu Darya River in the south. They established a system of fiefdoms under the Khans, and became the greatest threat on the northern border for the kingdoms of the Central Plains. 
the Gok Turks established a capital, calling it Daya. Like the Xiongnu before and the Mongols later, they lived nomadically in tents. The Turkic Khanate's military headquarters were set up by the Orkhon River in today's Kangai Mountains in Mongolia. This is Nilkar County in Ely Prefecture. The blacksmith stays busy making horseshoes for the herders. Before the new shoes are nailed to the horse's hooves, two people must tie down the horse's legs to stop it from kicking. Horseshoes, saddles and stirrups all make it easier for people to control a horse. In China, the development of these tools has a history of over 2,000 years. Currently, the world's oldest example of a stirrup is a pair of gilded wood core copper stirrups over 1,600 years old in Liaoning Provincial Museum. Western experts call this important piece of equestrian equipment a Chinese shoe. It represents a great contribution to the world from these ancient nomadic people. However, this 6th century copper stirrup unearthed in Ely Prefecture's Turkes County shows great improvement in materials and workmanship compared with those unearthed in Liaoning. Stirrups give riders strong support for their legs, enabling them to take full advantage of a horse's speed in a frontal attack. They also free up a rider's hands to use weapons and be more effective in battle. The Gok Turks' excellent horse gear and rapid strike battle tactics enable them to be swift, bold, and deadly. Even people of the mighty Tang dynasty were in awe of them. It's worth noting that the European medieval institutions of chivalry and knighthood followed soon after the stirrup was introduced to Europe. According to British sinologist Joseph Needham, just as gunpowder would later help to finally destroy the feudal system in Europe, China's stirrups helped to create the feudal system in the first place. Rarely do inventions as simple as the stirrup have such great historical significance. The Gok Turks took over from the Xiongnu and established a state as the new overlords of the steppes. In the Ely River Basin, with its favorable natural conditions, the Gok Turks established a number of military and civil strongholds. According to the history of the Northern Dynasties, for every enemy killed in battle, a stone statue would be erected in front of the soldier's grave. The achievements of a Turkic soldier over his lifetime would therefore be displayed at his grave after his death. Experts, however, believe that the stone statues are more likely statues of the warriors themselves. 
The statues hold a sword in one hand as if ready for combat. In the other hand is a goblet, possibly the legendary skull cap, a ritual drinking cup actually made from the skull of an enemy. As the Gok Turks spread across the steppes, they constantly fought and mixed with the indigenous tribes. Before the development of gunpowder, a curved broadsword and a strong horse were essential to survival, and they made the Turkic military forces a formidable foe. Meanwhile, another significant empire, the Sui dynasty, was becoming more and more powerful. In the course of history, their paths were bound to cross. In the year 581, the newly established Sui dynasty reversed the former custom of paying tribute to the Gok Turks. The Sui also built up the Great Wall, unified the north and the south of the country, and began adopting military and political measures to counter the Gok Turks. During the 37 years of the Sui dynasty, there were at least six major battles between the Sui and the Gok Turks. The one in 583 was a total victory for the Sui, and it led to civil unrest in the Turkic Khanate. Two years later, the Eastern Turkic Khanate joined the Sui dynasty while the Western Turkic Khanate continued to dominate the Western region and control the Silk Road through superior military might. At its height, the Western Turkic Khanate controlled as far west as the Aral Sea. In the year 617, Li Yuan led an uprising with military aid from the Eastern Turkic Khanate, crushing the Sui dynasty and founding the Tang dynasty. But beginning in 621, the Eastern Turkic Khanate made a series of invasions in various places, causing great hardship for the people who lived there. Tang constantly suffered the harassment of Gok Turk attacks. But against the Eastern Turkic Khanate, the Tang dynasty became bolder and stronger with each victorious battle. In 630, the Tang dynasty's northern expedition decisively defeated the Gok Turks, bringing an end to the history of the Eastern Turkic Khanate. Four further expeditions destroyed the Western Turkic Khanate, after which the Tang Dynasty established the Anxi Protectorate. The Gok Turks experienced ups and downs on the steppes. During conflicts with the Tang Dynasty in the states of the Western region, some Gok Turks migrated inland and intermixed with the peoples of the Central Plains. Others continued to spread westward. Turkic people along the Silk Road continued to mix with local indigenous populations, creating the different ethnic groups of today.
The ancient nationality of the Gokturks is no more. The wind blows over the steppes and the shadow of wars has faded away. Now there's only the enigmatic stone people guarding the graves. But this, however, is far from the end of the story as far as the stone people are concerned. Although most of the stone statues are just carved shapes which give no information about their owners or even time frame, people discovered markings on one statue which resemble a script, and this lifted their spirits. Still, many years after this discovery, no one had been able to interpret the symbols carved on the stone statue. But then in 1997, two Japanese scholars released a paper after investigation and research, claiming that the symbols were Sogdian writing, which was once common along the Silk Road. The Sogdian script was invented by the Sogdian people who lived in medieval Central Asia. Along the lengthy trade routes connecting the kingdoms of the Central Plains to the Mediterranean, the Sogdians had a long-standing reputation for their business acumen. The God Turks later adopted the Sogdian script for writing their own language. Among the vague and unclear symbols on the stone statue, the sixth line of this inscription has a decisive and clear meaning. It reads, Mulkan Kagan's grandson, the godlike Niri Kagan. The third and fourth lines state, ruled the kingdom for 21 years. The history books record that Mulkan Kagan and his grandson Niri Kagan were both monarchs during the period of the Turkic Khanates. It turns out that this stone man does indeed belong to the Gokturks. Furthermore, it's significantly connected to Niri Kagan. What were these two Kagans, Mukan and Niri, like as rulers? And why are the stone people of the Turkic Khanate standing in the plains of the Ili River Valley? According to records, Mukan Kagan ruled from 553 to 572, which corresponds to the time frame of the northern and southern dynasties in the central plains. Under his rule, the Turkic Khanate was divided into two parts, east and west. He extended the western Turkic Khanate to the Caspian Sea. By virtue of his outstanding achievements, Mukan Kagan established the first generation of leadership in the western Turkic Khanate. The name of the third Kagan of the Western Turks was Niri Kagan, the name mentioned in the inscription on the stone statue. Thanks to the previous two Kagans, Niri Kagan ruled over a vast territory. The Western Turkic Khanate already owned a large amount of territory, and the Ili River Valley in their territory was a geographically important fortress. Jiao Su was probably the site of the military headquarters, or at least an important stronghold of the Western Turkic Khanate. Jiao Su County is under Xinjiang's Ili Kazakh Autonomous Prefecture, and the Turkaz River flows through the whole territory. 
because of the long winters and cool summers, it's become popular with people avoiding the summer sun. Crossing the Tian Mountains from Jiaosu County, there's a mountain trail called the ancient Xia Te Road. It was the only route for traveling north from the kingdoms of the Central Plains to the Ili grasslands. Records show that Niri Kagan had a Han wife, so it's quite possible that he chose to live in Jiaosu because of its location. He may well be buried here. If it turns out that this stone statue does indeed mark the grave of Neri Kagan, it would make these stone statues extraordinarily significant. Their rarity alone makes them important, but they would also mark the only royal tomb of the Western Turkic Khanate ever found in China. In the year 603, Niri Kagan was killed in a battle with another tribe in the grasslands. It is recorded elsewhere that Niri Kagan reigned 16 years from 587 to 603 AD. Further study will be needed to resolve the discrepancy between this record and the inscription on the statue claiming 21 years. The succeeding 5th and 6th generation of Kagans worked hard to make the Western Turkic Khanate prosper. This achievement might be considered godlike, just as it says in the inscription. The Khanate constantly expanded their territory. Their military headquarters was moved west to Tianchuan in what is now Kyrgyzstan. But most importantly, this vast and prosperous empire 
also fostered exchange between East and West. According to records of the Tripitaka Master of the Temple of Great Mercy, written in the Tang Dynasty, when Xuanzang went to ancient India, he passed through the Western Turkic Khanate. There, he was received by Tung Yabgu, the sixth Kagan, and witnessed the prosperity brought by the Silk Road. Tung Yagbu Kagan met Xuanzang in his large, well-decorated tent. His ministers, dressed in silk robes, gathered on a mat in front of him in two long columns, and behind him stood heavily armed guards. Soon, the feast began. Specially prepared vegetarian food was presented to Xuanzang, including grape juice, rice cakes, milk, candy, honey, and raisins while the others were served beef and mutton. Tung Yagbu Kagan specially selected bodyguards to accompany Xuanzang on his quest. He picked men from the army who spoke Chinese and other languages spoken in the Western region. He also wrote many letters of introduction to officials of states in the region asking them to take care of Xuanzang. This clearly shows that Tung Yagbu Kagan greatly respected the Tang Dynasty and Xuanzang. It also shows the influence of Buddhism among the Gok Turks. The Western Gok Turks under Tung Yagbu Kagan adopted a proxy system to manage their vast territory. The Western Turkic Khanate also used marriage as a diplomatic tool. There was intermarrying between both royalty and common people, increasing ethnic integration. The Gok Turks were also involved in the silk trade, trading horses for silk and other luxury items from the Central Plains. By the time of Emperor Xuanzong of the Tang Dynasty, up to three or four thousand horses were traded each year. One year, a record 14,000 horses were traded, worth 500,000 pieces of silk. This was actually beyond the normal capacity of the Tang Dynasty, and it put great fiscal pressure on the government. Natural conditions and production capacity limited the quantity of textiles that could be produced, and both the costs and prices involved were far higher than that of tea leaves. But by contrast, there was great potential for tea production. Trading tea for horses made more accounting sense than trading coins, silk, or other goods. Considering the economic advantages, it was preferable for the kingdoms of the Central Plains to trade tea for horses. The Gok Turks were enthusiastic traders who maintained close commercial relations with the Central Plains to the southeast and Persia and Eastern Rome to the west. But the Gok Turks mainly relied on Sogdians, who were under their control, to conduct business for them. Within the Western Gok Turk territory, there were many tribes with excellent handicraft skills. Many of these skills were superior to those of both the Xiongnu and the Roran. Their skills were also superior to the Eastern Gok Turks, particularly their ability with precious metals, agate, jewelry, handware, and glass. In 
In October 1997, while building a road in Jiaosu, the 4th Agricultural Division of the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps uncovered a magnificent tomb over a thousand years old. The grave was looted as soon as it was opened. The police recovered many of the cultural relics, but some of the most precious artifacts remain lost. The relics were unearthed near a border post called Borma, so the tomb was called the Borma Tomb. The recovered artifacts are now in the Ely Kazakh Autonomous Prefecture Museum. This gold mask inlaid with rubies is item number one from the Borma tomb. As with similar archaeological discoveries in West Asia, it was probably used to cover the face of the deceased, but we know nothing about the owner. The gold mask is made from a single piece of pure gold. It's about the size of a person's face with realistic facial features. The eyes are set with two large rubies and the beard is made of 37 carefully arranged heart-shaped rubies. The workmanship is excellent and detailed and it makes use of almost every metal working technique then in existence. At the time, Westerners had more of a preference for gold masks than the Chinese. In the 14th century BC, Tutankhamun had a gold mask inlaid with precious stones and stained glass placed on his corpse. This Borma tomb mask is probably one of the most ornate of the few gold masks that have been unearthed in China. Experts say it may have been made by the Western Gok Turks and dates from the 6th or 7th century AD. Found in the same tomb was this gold cup inlaid with onyx. Even though it's slightly misshapen from being buried, it's obviously a very high quality artifact. The handle is shaped like a slender tiger and it's reminiscent of tiger and leopard handles that were popular on silverware in the Eastern Roman Empire. This could indicate artistic exchange between the Gok Turks and the West. Dionysus of Greek mythology is said to ride a tiger or a leopard, so in Greece and Rome, they're often depicted in artwork relating to Dionysus. They're also often portrayed taking a sip from a liquor jar. The tiger-handled gold cup unearthed in the Borma tomb is reminiscent of traditional Roman art. The Western Gok Turks maintained close diplomatic ties with Byzantium, which continued Roman culture. They may have brought back Byzantine silver articles to the Western Turkic Khanate as diplomatic gifts or spoils of war. Turkic artisans then copied their designs and adapted them to their own culture.
Inlaid rubies are a classic feature of the handicraft of the peoples who once lived on the plains. The use of inlaid rubies was also popular among nomadic peoples in the northern Eurasia region. Almost all of the gold and silver items unearthed from the Borma tomb are inlaid with rubies. Most of the items are of gold, reflecting the traditional Gokturk love of gold. Western gold and silver articles first appeared in China in the northern Wei dynasty. Artifacts from this era clearly come from the West or Central Asia, including the Eastern Roman Empire and Sasanian Empire. The Gokturks combined Eastern and Western cultural influences in their unique art. Dr. Dennis Senor, the Secretary General of the Permanent International Altaistic Conference, noted that the Empire of the Gok Turks created a link between the four great civilizations of Byzantium, Iran, India, and China. They not only carried out physical and spiritual cultural exchange between East and West, but also integrated different cultural influences and gave them a distinctly Turkic flavor. Their influence may not have lasted long, but the Gok Turks helped spread foreign civilization deeper into inland Eurasia. Other cultural relics recovered from the Borma tomb included gold swords, armor, earrings, and cups. These luxury items completely altered the former image of daily life for the nomads. Some experts believe that the Borma tomb may be that of a Western Gokturk Kagan or other royal personage. Other scholars, however, disagree with this assessment. They believe that the tomb is probably that of an earlier nomadic tribe on the Ely grasslands. The Scythians, Yujju, Wusuan, Xiongnu, Gokturks, and others were all active on the Ely grasslands at different times between the 3rd and 7th centuries AD the true owner of the Borma tomb remains a mystery. Though there is no final conclusion yet, the discovery of the Borma tomb is further proof of the important link that the Jiaosu steppe provided in connecting east and west through the Ili River Basin. It was these lush and romantic surroundings that witnessed east meeting west, and that was home to a brilliant and golden stamp civilization. Both the Borma tomb and the stone statues on the steppe are therefore inextricably linked to the Gok Turks. Actually, the stone statues are not confined to Xinjiang. From the Mongolian plateau in the east to Siberia in the south and to the grasslands on the coast of the Black Sea, the stone statues are found throughout the Asian steppes. Over 200 stone statues have been found in Xinjiang alone, mainly in the Altai Mountains, the Tian Mountains, and in the 10 prefectures and cities of western Dzungaria. The form of the statues differs by regions, and the statues include both male and female figures. Some are flat and some more rounded. Some are entire bodies, some are busts, and others just heads. But all the statues are 
located near rock pile tombs or stone coffins, and all face the rising sun in the east. Up to the 20th century, it was generally believed that the stone statues were left by Gok Turks. This was mainly because of their appearance, the direction they face, their clothing, and nearby archaeological finds. Experts now believe that this is not entirely correct. Some of the statues date from a thousand years before the Gok Turks. Long before the emergence of the Turkic Khanate, the Ely grasslands was home to a number of different nomadic peoples whose histories can be traced back as far as the early Qin dynasty. It's quite possible that the statues belong to one of these groups. Although various ethnic groups have emerged and disappeared over the centuries, some of the culture of the Ely grasslands endured over a thousand years. This was the culture that created the stone statues. In history, patterns often appear. If a ruler fails to adjust to contemporary political and economic trends, he or she will inevitably bring down the entire dynasty. Tung Yagbu Kagan was the sixth ruler of the Western Turkic Khanate. Towards the end of his rule, he became an arrogant and heavy-handed ruler, leading to one rebellion after another. In the year 627, after 12 years on the throne, Tung Yagbu Kagan was killed by his uncle. The Western Turkic Khanate was thrown into chaos, marking the beginning of the end for the enormous Gok Turk regime. Relations between the Western Gokturks and the Tang Dynasty had always been good. The Gokturks traded for goods from the Central Plains. In addition, the demand from Persia, Byzantium, and even Europe for Chinese silk was constantly growing. The Western Gokturks cooperated with the powerful Tang Dynasty simply because it was in their best financial interests. Therefore, even after the death of Tong Yagbu Kagan, the next Kagan accepted the oversight of the Tang Dynasty. However, the Gok Turk rulers gradually turned against the Tang Dynasty, which sent troops to the Western region in response. After several rounds of surrender and rebellion, the history of the Western Turkic Khanate finally reached its end. After losing an internal power struggle, the current leader of the Western Gok Turks, Ashina Hulu, defected to the Tang Dynasty as left general in chief of the military. But after the death of Emperor Taizong, Hulu changed his mind and cut off the main east west merchant routes. The Tang Dynasty responded with a series of assaults on the Western Gok Turks, eventually switching from a carrot and stick approach to an offensive strategy.
Emperor Gaozong launched three large-scale military campaigns named after the Ili River Basin area where they took place. The Western Gok Turks sustained major losses. In two campaigns, the Tang troops broke through to the Ili River Basin. One campaign in particular was aimed directly at Ili. The large-scale third campaign consisted of offences in what are now the Ili River Basin. The Western Gok Turks were totally defeated. The ten tribes of the Khanate came under Tang authority and the Ili River Basin was once again unified. Tang Dynasty jurisdiction now covered most of the Pamir Plateau, ushering in a relatively stable, peaceful period in Ili history. The occasional attacks of the nomadic tribes on the agricultural societies of the Central Plains actually stimulated constant renewal and growth. In a way, the constant provocation from the nomads allowed civilization on the Central Plains to continue and evolve. Just as when the Han fought the Xiongnu, when the Tang struggled against the Gok Turks, the perilous circumstances drove them to act and made them bolder and more powerful through their experience in battle. This is the site of the ancient city of Gongyu, located in modern-day Yuzhe Township in Ili Prefecture. Nothing remains of the ruins of the ancient city, which have been totally destroyed by centuries of warfare. But on the site where the ancient city once stood, the local government has built a tourist attraction called Gongyu Folk Culture Park. Gungyur appears in histories of the Tang Dynasty and is said to have first referred to a tribe. The area where they gathered and built a city then took the same name. The rise and fall of Gungyur is closely connected to that of the Western Gok Turks. It was once their second capital. In the year 657, the Tang army launched a major attack on Gongyu, killing 100,000 elite Western Gok Turks soldiers. Ashina Hulu, leader of the Western Gok Turks, witnessed the massacre and fled in panic. Following up his already established victory, the 65-year-old Tang general Su Dingfang gave chase and completely annihilated the remaining Gok Turk army. Ashina Hulu was captured and he repented. He said that he knew he deserved death for his betrayal after Emperor Taizong had treated him so well. Gaozong took pity on Ashina Hulu and decided not to have him executed. After the fall of the Western Turkic Khanate, the Tang Dynasty established several administrative bodies to manage the region and this sparked a wave of exchange and intermixing among the cultures and peoples of the Western region. Meanwhile, the Tang Dynasty was becoming a world superpower. Throughout history, there's been a convergence of steppe and central plain civilizations with continuous exchange between the two very different cultures. One was more passive, the other more active. One was tied to their home, while the other was nomadic. But this constant interaction stimulated the development of the two, promoting transformation and assimilation. For the people on horseback, 
Their home was wherever their nomadic life took them. Such a nation could rapidly make vast territorial gains, but then lose them all overnight. The hills here still reverberate with the sound of the river, while the stone statues remain silent. It's a place of both endings and beginnings. As the story of the Gok Turks gradually faded into history, a new force was emerging, one that would become the new rulers of the steppes. A mysterious carved stone cross represents a journey from the capital to far-flung Al-Malik. A veteran of the Liao Empire makes the Kitans world famous. And a Mongolian eventually transforms the pattern of religion in the western region. Join us to find traces of the Chagatai Khanate and the Kitan Empire in part three of On the Banks of the Ili River.